Here we go. An official good morning to you all, everybody. My name is Megan Barrett, and I am the director here at the Iowa Quilt Museum. We are located in Winterset, which is just about 30 miles southwest of Des Moines. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the Iowa Quilt Museum as we go along, but we are located in a former JCPenney building, which is right on the town square. We're sandwiched in between two wonderful quilt shops, um, and we consider ourselves to be a pretty um, pretty fun place to visit, if we do say so ourselves. And right now our exhibit is uh, String Theory, String Pieced Quilts from Past to Present. You can see a couple examples of that behind me. And this was curated for us by Lindsay McRae, who is one of our guests today. Our other three guests are Tara Fonin and Fern Royce, who are both joining us from California, Little Jealous, and Sarah Nishura, who is joining us from Chicago. Not quite as jealous of Sarah because they got 17 inches of snow last night. Oh my uh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although we do have negative 35 degree wind temps in Iowa today, so <laughs> I don't know which is worse. <laughs> We're at about zero, so uh, you beat us on that one. Yeah. Uh, somebody pointed out to me the other day that negative 40 is where Celsius and Fahrenheit scales meet. Um, so we're just about there. I don't know what that means, but it just seems significant. <laughs> feels special. It, yes, we do feel special. There have been times, actually, during the winter where Iowa's wind chill temperatures are colder than that in Antarctica. Um, and that always makes me feel really special, too. <laughs> so anyway, enough about the weather. I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Lindsay McRae, who is the curator of this exhibit, who has created this idea and um, culled together the, the quilts for this collection. And Lindsay, um, I know some of people may have heard this before, but we've got several new people with us today. So would you just tell us, A, a little bit about yourself and a little bit about how the idea for this exhibit came to you and how you pulled the quilts together for this particular exhibit? Thanks, Megan. Um, well, I am, I, for, for many years, thought of myself primarily as a writer. I'm a uh, trained as a journalist and I worked as a writer and editor for the University of Iowa for about 13 years and during that time I was feeling a little dissatisfied with my work and I learned to quilt and I thought well I'm just going to see if um, this Meredith which publishes a lot of the big quilting magazines is in Des Moines if they need any help and I had a contact there and sure enough they did and I started writing for them and it's just been things have just rolled along from there. Um, in the interim, between then and now, I've written, in addition to all the articles that I've written, I've written a couple of books. And um, the first one was Art Quilts of the Midwest. And when the Iowa Quilt Museum was just getting going, I um, was speaking with Mary Ann and she said, you know, that would be a great exhibit. And so that was sort of the beginning of my curatorial career, which um, has been really fun. And that uh, exhibit ended up traveling to the Texas Quilt Museum, the National Quilt Museum, and it was also a portion of it where it was at um, in Lincoln at the International Quilt Study Center. Um, and, at, and then I also did an exhibit, um, when my second book was on feed sacks and I did an exhibit at um, the Iowa Quilt Museum, uh, curated an exhibit of feed sacks. So string quilts, string pieced quilts are just something I have always loved. Um, because of my love of feed sacks and that whole era, I'm very fond of the whole concept of making do, using what you have, not wasting any little bit. And string piece quilts are really fall into that category. I've told this story before, but when my mom passed away two years ago and I was cleaning out her sewing room, she was not a quilter, but she was an amazing um, seamstress, she would have been called herself who made clothing and I was unrolling I found all these little bundles of scraps that were rolled up very carefully saved and I unrolled them and I realized there were all these long strips because when you lay out a clothing on a on yardage you either put it on the fold or on the straight of the grain and so you're left with these long strips and these strips often are too small to use for traditional quilt patterns. And it was sort of this aha moment where I was like, oh, I bet this is a lot of how string piecing came about is that using up those clothing scraps and subsequently have learned from Barbara Brackman that um, clothing companies actually sold bags of uh, they called quilt bundles, which were remaining scraps. And um, there's a wonderful quilt in the exhibit that is scraps from a pajama factory. Um, that still includes labels um, that were still left on and sewn into the quilt. Um, 
that we have looked at before. So I was just very interested and pitched the idea a couple of years ago to the museum and they were interested and I just started looking. I, I started off with Rod Kirikoff's Unconventional and Unexpected book because it's my favorite quilt book of all time and um, had a lot of beautiful quilts in there and we indeed included a number of quilts um, from that collection that he has. But I really, the thing, one of the things I love so much about string piecing is that it's not just a technique that you find in old quilts. And I think the quilters we have here today, the artists that are here today really exemplify that, that it's a, such a versatile technique and it can be used in so many ways and for so many reasons. And so I'm super excited to hear what Fern, Sarah and Tara have to say today. It's a good point that you just made about, um... Sorry, totally lost that train of thought. Maybe I'll come back to it. <laughs> like, oh, I'm going to pick up on that. It's totally gone. So I'm going to pass things over to Tara just because she's the next person on my screen. And so Tara is a contributor to this exhibit. And we would love to hear a little bit more about you and how you quilt and why you quilt and what you quilt. Um, and then we'll look more closely at the piece you have in this exhibit a little bit later. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so, yeah, welcome. Let's see. What we, what, why I quilt, how I quilt. I mean, how many hours do we have? Because, <laughs> <laughs> um, let me, you know, um, I got into quilting um, about 20 years ago. But really, my mom told me the story recently that at the Oakland Museum here, uh, there was an there was a quilt exhibit uh, back in the eighties, probably several. Uh, Fern, you probably went to them. But my I I think school, uh, we went as a class to this quilt exhibit at the museum, and apparently, my mom told me that I lied to the teachers and told them that I actually hadn't gone, so that I got to go twice. Um, and it was a big kerfluffle because nobody knew where I was because I had snuck off to go to the quilt exhibit again. Uh, and I don't remember any of this, but I obviously, my love of quilts is deep. And when I finally started quilting, um, you know, I just knew that was, that was it. That was the last, you know, art form I was going to try. So that was 20 years ago. Um, why I quilt? <laughs> because I have to, like, I can't not. Um, it's, it's, every expression of creativity to me. So, um, you know, I don't really know why I quilt. I'm just driven to do it. Uh, like painters are driven to paint. You know, some people are just driven to certain certain art forms. And I find that the, the, the nature of the medium that we work in is so fascinating to me. Um, string quilts are part of that. You know, just every bit is, you know, with painting, you get to just add a blob of yellow or, or you know, just throw a little bit here and there. But with fabric, you have so many constraints that are built into the skill making and how you actually express ideas. Um, and I love geometric form, but I've also gotten really into fusible. So the string quilt behind you is um, I did with, with fusibles. Um, so uh, not pieced at all. And I, I just think that exploring all the techniques um, really helps me when I have an idea that I wanna express, I can figure out what technique to use to do it. And for the idea behind the quilt that is right behind you that I did, um, I actually did try to piece it. I had a little mock-up of strings that I had done in Fusible and I was kind of like, oh, you know, seams are so much better, they're so superior. And then I tried to piece it and I lost the beautiful organic nature of those shapes and they became very rigid. And that was when I made the switch that, you know, I call myself like a seamist, right? Like I was like, seams are just better, you know, why? I was just like this thing that I had stuck in my head. And, um, you know, I hang out with a lot of art quilters and they're always like, here, try this glue stick. You know, they're like these little pushes, <laughs> just called fusible. Just try it, just try it. You know? <laughs> um, so, so I ended up making that quilt uh, pieced and fused because it allowed me to express the shape that I wanted to express the best. Tara, can I ask a question about yeah. um, the fact that you did that with fusible or you said it was more rigid. Was it because the seams, if the pieces are so small that in order to seam it, you just didn't, couldn't get that size or I'm curious about that. Um, yeah, you know what, it was actually the, the frontal application of the, the strips that 
that got lost. So when you're, when you're sewing, you're sewing from the back. And I couldn't see the lines that I was creating. I see. Okay. And that's where it went really weird because um, the lines that I created with that quilt, I, I did it from the front, right? And I kind of nudged and, and moved things around to create the lines that I wanted. And when I, yeah, so sewing from the back, you are sewing blind, right? You don't know exactly what it is you're gonna be create. Um, and it, isn't it in reverse? Like, anyways, it didn't come out right. <laughs> That quilt also has something special that Megan really likes about it, too. I was just about to say that, and it's going to be impossible for me to show it to you. I've tried lots of different angles, but it sparkles. It's got, um, it's got gold thread in it, and so it shimmers and sparkles. And so when I come from the front of the gallery to the back of the gallery where my desk is, I can choose to go along the east wall or the north or the west wall and I almost always choose the west wall because then I get to see the shimmer of Tara's quilt as I walk past it um, but I, I just can't get that to show up on video or photo either one um, unfortunately so um, if you're traveling between now and March 21st you need to get yourself to the Iowa Quilt Museum so you can see Tara's quilt shimmer in person so there we go that's how we solve that <laughs> Tara, anything else from you before we move on? Um, it's, uh, we could just go. <laughs> I got this back long and I got to rein myself in. <laughs> There's so much to say. I mean, how do you sum up what quilting means to you in a, in a, in a minute or two, right? I mean, probably for everybody here, it's, that would be a tough, a tough call. Yeah. So let's switch over to Fern and see if she can um, sum up her quilting journey in a few short minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, sorry, are you ready? Yes. Okay. Um, I've been sewing about uh, 25 years. I mean, not sewing, but quilting about 25 years, but sewing forever. Cause, and I always was attracted to fabric and textiles and um, came from a family that, that did a lot of that stuff. They were makers. Um, but my quilting started after my fourth child was born. I was kind of like not working anymore <laughs> except at home. And um, I took a quilt class just because someone else said, oh, I should take a quilt class. I had been sewing, um, making costumes for kids and selling them at the, uh, the craft fairs in our lo local area. So I had all this fabric and I kept thinking, well, great, I can use up this fabric. But when you, took classes in the 90s, it was you buy all cotton, you do this, you do that. It was very, very um, kind of rule oriented. And uh, it took me a while to get past that and go, but but I have all this fabric and, and I really want to use this. And so I was always attracted to the quirky and the odd. And that's why Rob Kirikoff's book always is one of my favorites. And um, then I, I tried string quilting. I used a um, cloth um, foundation first and didn't like the weight of it. Then I went to paper piecing and hated taking the paper off. And then I found Gwen Marston's book called uh, Liberated String Quilting. It was like game changer for me. It was just fabulous. It was wonderful. And I've been string piecing ever since. It's so much easier for me to use scraps than to cut into to fabric. You know, I just, I like using what I have and using it as it is. And, I, and I'm like Tara, I don't, I don't think I could stop quilting. It just is what I have to do. <laughs> That's about it. Very good, very good. All right, we'll pass things over to Sarah and hear from our Chicago quilter. <laughs> I know I feel out of place not being from California here. Um, <laughs> Yeah, similar story. I mean, I just absolutely love quilting. I started out as a painter and studied fine arts, visual arts in school. Um, and I really, you know, learned so much that I apply to my quilts in my background as a painter. But the thing about quilting is that, well, it's two things. One is that I really like the process and I like um, that it's something that really is suitable to working at home. I'm also a hand quilter. So I like that part of my process is a very um, 
absent-minded process. You know, it's something I can just do and fill time. And I like that part of my process is very focused on design and, and hands and making. So there's kind of these two things that appeal to me that didn't exist in painting. Um, but I also really like the quilt world better <laughs> than the painting world. Um, once I got out of grad school and was trying to like approach galleries and that whole world, I just, I confronted so many issues that I just didn't feel um, in sync with. So the quilting world and also the history of quilting and the connection between women and quilts and um, our own handcrafts that we've developed over centuries is something that I just really feel connected to and happy to be a part of. Um, and so when it comes to string quilting, um, I think my interest in it is as much historical as it is in terms of what it does for the particular piece that I'm making. So I, I don't use string quilting necessarily, but when I was creating the quilt that's in the exhibition or when I've been I've done a lot of teaching of string quilts it's always sort of thinking back to these these historical models which I just absolutely adore um, and I taught a class recently I did a whole class on make do and we did a session on string and I invited Roderick to come and I only know him you know through the internet but I thought you know whatever we're in pandemic let's just make the send the email and see what happens and he was like sure I'd love to come so we had a great discussion about sort of this connection between string quilting and the the legacy of quilts through the generations and then making them now and all these things so I just really have have loved thinking about strings and in, in the context of this make do moment and the history of make do as well. So, yeah, we're really in a lot of um, we're in a make do kind of time again. Um, we're in a different kind of way, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. Technology has made it possible for us to make do in some different ways, and this particular program, for an example, I mean. Um, it's very unlikely that we would have had programs with all 11 contributors to this exhibit if we hadn't done it virtually. So that's a really wonderful part of this. Um, and thank you so much to all of you. I'll say it several times, but thank you so much for sharing your time with us this morning, in addition to sharing your quilts with us. Um, to everyone else who's watching this morning, if you want to pop a comment into the chat window, you are absolutely welcome to do that. And I will continue monitoring that as we kind of go through our discussion here. Um, we will look at pictures of everybody's quilts who have contributed to this exhibit, um, but we don't have to stick to that particular topic of conversation. Um, if our topic takes us somewhere else, we'll just go with it. That's kind of the name of the game on these um, sessions. If you are interested in seeing a very up close look at the entire exhibit and you don't think you're going to be able to make it in person, we have put together what we're calling a virtually gallery walk. Um, and so that is just high resolution photos of all of the quilts in the exhibit. Um, and the narration of the exhibit signage is put on top of those. And so it's really just about a 25 minute walk through the gallery with the photos. And that is available for purchase on our online store. And I'll put that link in the chat window before we leave today. So Lindsay, do you have anything you want to um, pose before we kind of pull up the quilts? Um, no, I think maybe probably as we see the quilts, things will come up. I did, somebody did have a question about the books that were mentioned. Um, and I thought it was worth, I, I don't, don't have my unconventional and unexpected to hold it up. Marianne Fawns just put a little comment in there. Um, I, mine is downstairs, so I can't get it. I do have the Gwen Marston book and I can get that, but <laughs> uh, up here in my sewing room. So, oh, oh there we go. All right, Tara's. <laughs> um, okay. Roderick think... mentioned is that it's out of print, but that something exciting might be happening. So we don't know if it's gonna be reprinted or what, what he meant, but that's the one. And um, while people are talking, I'll go and get the other one and we can show it too. Sure. And if we can just put the title in the chat window for people to be able to find that as well, that'd be great. Okay, so I'm going to do a screen share. And it looks like Tara's quilt is up first. 
And so we'll pull in a closer look than what you're getting over my shoulder. Um, Tara, I know you've already told us a little bit about your process for this one, but what else can you tell us about the design aspects of how you landed on this? Um, you know, there, I wanted to create something too with those big spaces where there are no um, strings in those blocks. And for me, what I'm constantly finding interesting um, is the quilts from, from books like Unconventional Unexpected, where the patterning is broken up, right? And so even though most of my quilts are not at all freeform, they're not liberated, they are very precise, uh, what I draw inspiration from is having unexpected patterning. And so that's what those big spaces are about. To me, it was more interesting to have a big empty field rather than continue the string piecing uh, because of the rhythm and the patterning that that created. So that's, that's the other part of this quilt um, that I found interesting. And like Sarah I, and Fern too, um, we're all hand quilters, but there was, you can't hand quilt through fusible if you want to have your hands <laughs> available to you later on. Uh, so that's why I ended up uh, machine quilting this one. Mm -hmm. Um, Can I ask you use this you, when I first contacted you there was another string quilt that I was interested in and you said that was a quilt that you used a lot and so it wasn't in very good show shape but so you actually use your quilts as well as. Um, yeah, I, I have made in the past um, quilts for my husband and I uh, to throw on the bed, but that's kind of the first time in, in 20 years that I really made a bed quilt um, specifically for us. And the problem is with that string quilt is um, actually I, I, it was a foray into wool batting and I got a bad batch of wool batting. Oh. And so it's quite bearded. Um, I made a couple of quilts with this bad batch of batting and hand quilted them. And um, so, so they go on our bed. Okay. <laughs> but they serve their quilt to purpose, I imagine quite well and keep you, <laughs> keep you. Yeah, I know. It was great. It was great that I got that bad batch of batting because now I actually, we have quite a few quilts that we can use. Um, <laughs> and, and also, you know, uh, quilters, cats, like cats, they, their purpose in life is to puke on your quilts, right? I mean, that's what they do. So for all of my quilts that go to shows, they do not come out of the closet. Like the cats can't, they don't, you know, they like to need them. And it's horrible. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I don't know what is the next picture, but here we go. This is one of Fern's, am I correct? Yes, yes. I'm, I don't have all of my notes right in front of me and I'm, my mind seems to be a little bit scattered this morning. So you just stop me all if I say something really unintelligent, okay? Okay, um, this one I, I called uh, Down the Rabbit Hole because it started with the bigger blocks where it's really a, um, nine patch variation. You just have triangles on the corners. And I made all these blocks of strings. I, I loved it. And I was, then it was like, okay, how am I going to put it together? And I tried all sorts of different settings. I didn't like them mushed together. I didn't like them um, with a big block between them. It was just, there was just so many times like, ah, that's not working. I don't know. If, that's always my thing is like, do I like this? What about this? It's that curiosity. And um, finally, I realized I think it needs little mini of these blocks in the corners, which means that they were like three inches, and that's three inches of a nine patch. And I told the friend, and she just looked at me like, oh, "You're crazy." <laughs> I, like, I know, but that's what it needs. And so those little nine patch variation in the um, post are um, one inch, finishing at one inch. Um, and they're not, they're not string pieced. I wasn't that crazy, um, <laughs> but they are, but I use really colorful fabrics, really multi-print so that you could kind of get the same feeling as you got in the big blocks. And so I called it down the rabbit hole because every decision I made took me further and further into this maze of, oh, what am I gonna do? So that's the rabbit hole. And this quote, is on our bed training exhibit, um, which is a unique ex part of the Iowa Quilt Museum, I think. So we have this um, antique walnut bed that's on loan to us from our local historical museum. And it sits up on our mezzanine level, which is another unique aspect of our museum. 
Um, but our guests um, and docents, wearing the white gloves, of course, they can turn through the quilts that are on the bed turning and um, get to see the backs, which visitors love, of course. Um, and then just getting to interact with those quilts. It's not something we typically get to do when we go to museums. Um, the other nifty part about our mezzanine level, it, it's kind of a balcony overlooking the gallery. Um, and so you can see the quilts from a kind of a bird's eye view. In fact, if you've seen any of the photographs um, that I put on um, our website or social media, I often use a quilt or a photograph from up there and there's a really great one that features Sarah's quilt that we'll see in a little bit um, because it is at the back of the gallery so I can see it really well from the, from the mezzanine. So some interesting aspects to the Iowa Quilt Museum if you have not visited in person. So Fern, here's another of your quilts. Oh, right? Yes, it is, yeah. Uh, this is one of my favorites. It was actually inspired by a wood quilt by Laura Petrovich Cheney. I saw it on Instagram and said, oh my God, I've got to recreate that in fabric. Hers was the yellow um, of the star was made out of pencils. You know, those ubiquitous, what is the name of the, the pencil? But everybody had them, you had yellow pencils. And so um, I just pulled out all my yellow fabric. It, you, it, I could use every type of fabric of the yellows. They didn't, it just all went together. And I had this really dark, what I considered kind of ugly fabric that I had it set aside to give away. And even though when I teach string quilting, which I, that's one of the main classes I teach, um, I always tell people, oh, it's it's not ugly. It just hasn't been cut small enough. I was not using my own advice, and but I found out that I had to pull those ugly fabrics and put them in the quilt. And that's how they made the background. All the ugly, dark, dark, dark browns and stuff made that contrast with the yellow. Um, so. Sorry, I had to pop away from that for just a that's minute. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So there, it's kind of long ca log cabin strings and just regular strings. Yeah, and this one is really um, an eye catcher in the gallery as well. People are really enjoying this quilt fern. Um, and it just, it's so striking, the contrast between the yellow and the darker fabrics. I've heard lots of people say, ooh, I might have to, um, you know, kind of recreate that. And it's, um, it's a traditional, block, you know, it's a traditional pattern. Um, so it is something that people after visiting our gallery feel like, well, I could take, I could go away and just kind of recreate that on my own, figuring out how to lay out the squares and the half square triangles and strip piecing. And um, so Laura Petrovich Cheney and Fern Royce are having a widespread influence on people's <laughs> mind next year or year and a half or so. Fern, is this one um, foundation piece or is it just I don't foundation piece. You don't It's at all. all just, no, it's like once I found Gwen's book, it was like, I'm done. I'm, I use a template sometimes, either my ruler or a cardboard piece of, of to, to see if I've got the right size I want, because if you're doing diagonal, you want to make sure you're covering, but I do right. not. I've, I've never done paper, um, any kind of foundation since that. I never looked back. It was like, never okay. <laughs> So approximate size of this one, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Fern, this was about 40 inches by 40 inches or, or so? Yeah, about like that, yeah. yeah. The blocks were seven to six inches. Okay, yeah. and then we also asked about down the rabbit hole um, and it's, it's on the smaller side as well. I wanna say maybe it's um, 48 by 60-ish. Does that sound about right? I think it's a little bit bigger than 48 on the, um, but yeah, I tend to make them small because I take them classes and, you know, it's used for demonstrations. And yeah, it, it's laying up on the bed, but it, it's, um, it's the smallest one that's on the bed. And so it just kind of <laughs> barely covers the top of a full size bed. It does not go over the sides at all, but yes, it is very vibrant. Sorry, Ann comments. It's a, uh, it's really a, a neat quilt. So if I choose to walk down the east wall um, instead of the west wall, I get to see this one instead. So I sometimes do that too, of course. <laughs> and then I also get to see this one. These two of ferns are on the same wall. And this one is called Last Bits. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, this one was, um, I, kept, I saved the last bits. <laughs> I say, and I, but that time I have been making a lot of string quilts and teaching a lot of string quilts. And I also, if my students throw things away, it, they tend to come out of the, jump out of the garbage can and come onto my table. Yes, <laughs> because it's like, if it's three quarters of an inch or larger, my, my string quilts are usually from three quarters of an inch to one and a half inches. That's the size I use. And these were just, as you make a block, you might trim it, trim it off. And these were the little trimmings left over. And so I started playing with that. Um, and I thought, well, what if I just free cut slice? So it's not a very obvious curve, but just slice it through that triangle and then insert those. And then it'll give it a bit of movement um, that's not really obvious, but it's kind of subtle. Your eye just moves a little differently. And as I was making them, I think I made about five or six and I realized nobody else is gonna save their last bits and use these. So I need to figure out a way to teach people to, to make last bits, make different sizes and make their own quilt like this. So you can make a slab and slice it up. And since they're so small, you won't see the repeats. And that's one of the things I love about string quilts is not seeing the repeats. I don't wanna see the same fabric everywhere in the quilt. I like to see it scattered throughout the quilt. Um, so yeah, now I, I learned a different way. Once I did my long laborious way, I went back and figured out how to teach it without the kind of patience or just kind of piddling. I, I just like to mess with my fabric. <laughs> now, I think I've heard for you mentioned teaching and Sarah, I know that you teaching, you teach. Tara, you teach as well. Is that correct? Yeah. So we might come back to that teaching aspect of how that has kind of influenced your your journey as a as a quilter. Um, I'm a teacher, or I was a teacher, but a music teacher. Um, so I come to quilting from a very different kind of background. But before we go to that, Sarah, tell us about the striking quilt. Yeah, so this is, um, I, in my head, I call it my vanishing point quilt because it was designed thinking, um, starting originating from a drawing of um, a vanishing point like you would see in the Renaissance sort of, you know, mapping out the idea of space. Um, but I made it so that the lines um, zoom towards a vanishing point that's off of the quilt plane because obviously if we had all of those points coming together as any quilter knows that would be a nightmare it would be like a huge lump at the top of the quilt so it's been you know edited or cropped um, yeah and I made this quilt I all of my quilts I have been working with only recycled materials for the quilt tops um, for ages and one of the things that sort of fascinates me is how these materials um, can fall into a category like dark brown, and then they all have very, very different qualities as opposed to buying things at a, at a quilt store where often, or a fabric store where often everything has sort of the same tonality or you know basic dyes. So I really love to make quilts that are based on like a single color pattern uh, palette and then just watch those different colors reveal themselves. So the range of what brown means. And often when I'm shopping, I go to thrift stores and things, I'll think I'm buying a brown that I'm gonna take home and it's almost the same as something else. And then I get it and put it next to it, uh, the other ones and I see the differences and that just really interests me. Um, and the thing about string piecing that I love is it, that it fits really well into my general interest in geometry and ways to manipulate geometries to make my quilt designs. So um, even, you know, the traditional like um, spider web quilt, I think there's some in the exhibit, things like that. They're always based on one um, particular geometric form and then the ways that it, it turns into a quilt is the ways that those are rotated or the variations that you can get just manipulating those geometries. So that's kind of the basis of this quilt as well. So I'm, I'm reading the comments right now. Um, and one of them is makes me feel like I'm inside a tower or a silo. And <laughs> I, have the, I have the fortune of hearing a lot of comments from our in-person visitors. And we've gotten, there's lots of different um, perspectives on this quilt, Sarah, because not everybody's, um, sometimes I hear their comments before they've actually read the description. 
about the vanishing point. So I've heard everything from spider web to, um, you know, kind of the tower or the silo or the skyscraper. Uh, my son thinks it looks a little bit like the Death Star. Um, <laughs> I love that. That's yeah. awesome. That's one of the really interesting things that I get to hear here at the museum is yes. um, people's, inter you know, their own interpretations yes. of quilts and their own impressions. Um, I've heard people talking about it seem like they're flying above it, like an aerial view. Mm -hmm. um, I really designed it like all of my quilts, I, they're for they're for queen size beds or, um, you know, double to queen size beds. And so I, even though I uh, love seeing it upright like that in, in my mind, when I was making it, I was thinking about it as falling over the bed mm -hmm. and zooming towards the pillow. So there's this kind of um, different geometry. If you put it, if you could imagine it in 3d as well. So that's sort of how my brain thinks of it. I think that's a good point, um, Megan. I don't know the exact dimensions, but it's a really large piece, which is yeah. so cool too. I mean, it's just so stunning. Yeah, it's about 85 by 90, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm gonna do another quick little screen share. Um, and this is um, a website where Sarah sells quilts, it's Oaken Arts. Um, and so there's a little bit of background. <laughs> Um, so here's the quilt, I assume, shortly after it was completed. Um, and here it is. But here's the drawing. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. So this is the part that I found the most fascinating, is you can see how the quilt then is a snapshot or a, a crop in of this whole vanishing point concept. And that really does kind of hone in that idea. And yeah, then so I... I did construct it as blocks, just like anyone would construct uh, something that was straight right angle blocks, but I just figured out the proportions for the change shifts in size. So each one of those was, was um, put, you know, sewn as a block and I had a big pile of the blocks and then I was able to sew them together in long rows and sew those rows together. Mm -hmm. Wow. Very cool. Here's another. Anyway, I won't take us down that rabbit hole. <laughs> All right, so I'm checking the, um, the chat window to see if there's anything I need to bring up. Um, so let's, let's kind of go back to the idea of design. Sarah's just touched on that a little bit about how she approaches designing a quilt. Um, Tara, Fern, Sarah, just jump in anytime. And Lindsay, you as well, because you're a quilt designer. When, when you're ready to start a new project, um, how do you approach the design process? Is it kind of a, um, an inspiration or does it a little bit fiddlier than that? Does it kind of come along as you work on it or is it all of those things? All of them. Yeah, I definitely agree. All of those things. Yeah, all of those things. Like sometimes you just make a block, like an hourglass mm -hmm. block. And you're like, oh, well, I'm just going to make 20 more of these and see what happens. Yeah. Or, you know, I mean, it's, it's sometimes I'll draw it out on on paper or the computer and get like sketch out the idea. And then um, sometimes, yeah, I mean, all all of it, all the approaches, right? Mm -hmm. Mostly it involves cutting up a bunch of fabric. And um, in my teaching, I'm always like, don't don't worry about wasting fabric. Um, but I have eight boxes of scraps and a full box of, and I'm, I'm talking like big boxes of, of strings. So, you know, I create a lot of scraps because I'm like, well, just cut the fabric, just cut it. And then I'm like, nah, and then I throw it in the scrap bin and then, you know, so. I remember Tara talking about how she would throw away or put in bags her scraps. And I was like, oh, <laughs> and then, I, then it, I've seen her evolve where she actually does start using them because I've known her over the years. But, but it was just the idea of like, oh my God, all those scraps of Tara's, wouldn't they? <laughs> I want to get in them. <laughs> and I finally liberated myself from, you know, because it's a bit of a problem, this scrap hoarding. And I finally was like, okay, there's going to be a certain size where I'm going to throw it out. And then a couple of weekends ago, I took a class with a friend more string quilts 
No. I mean, and these are like less, these are unusable if you're going to actually sew a seam. And I was, I was at the simultaneously cursing and loving her. I was like, oh, oh, now I can't throw anything out. So now I have a new bag of like tiny scraps that are useless unless you fuse them. So that's true. That's it. <laughs> but you know what? You don't even have to fuse them because then after using the three quarter inch, I, I took a class from Sean Kimber and she does even smaller. And so it was kind of like, oh my God, this is, I, I can go smaller now. <laughs> and so, yeah, you, I don't throw away unless, or I actually, I pass them on. I don't really throw away unless it's like there's a quarter inch and you can't get a seam in it. So, yeah. <laughs> so that kind of leads to the next question that was just in the, <laughs> in the chat is, do you all use a standard quarter inch seam? Now, Tara, obviously, if you're doing a fused project, not, um, but standard quarter inch seam, pretty much? Yes and no. I do. But most of the time, yes. So, Fern, sometimes smaller than that? Yes, if it's just a little tiny piece and I really need to get it, I will, I will use, I, will, I won't go under an eighth of an inch because I want to put, if it's going to be that small, I put a little second seam on there so that it doesn't fray out. Yeah, so. I have a question about in the design process and it was after looking at Sarah's quilt just now up close, um, how the quilting itself, because you're all hand quilters, how the quilting itself plays into the design and whether you think about that before or as afterward or how, how it works for you in terms of the design. For me, it's after. I don't really think, oh, I'm going to quilt in such and such a way. Uh, it's after it's done, then it's kind of like you're in each process at the time. First, I'm making just the blocks. And I'm thinking about that and then I'm putting it together. But it's after I've got it together that I start thinking about quilting design. That's for me. Yeah. A little of both, I think. I lately have been doing quilts that have a lot more um, negative space. And so knowing that those are going to be big expanses that don't have anything going on, but the texture that I'm adding to them. Mm -hmm. um, I've been thinking about it more, but my quilting tends to sort of um, just reinforce the geometries of the piecing. So if I'm filling up negative space, it probably has some relationship to the pattern that's going on in the piecing. Um, and the other thing is like with Tara's quilt, I really loved um, that machine piecing with those organic sort of um, fused pieces. So just sort of thinking about ways that that quilting can kind of um, have dialogue with the piecing itself is always a part of my thought process. So it might not be articulated until I get to that phase, but it's, um, it sort of follows that pattern. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed on that quilt of yours, Sarah, the, the, blo the blocks, I guess, and the way you quilted it, some went one direction, some went mm -hmm. another, which really added to the movement and the, just, it was great. I really appreciated that. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and sometimes it's just technical stuff too. Like you don't want your quilting to follow all the same seam lines. Like if you if you don't want to constantly be having to quilt through seam, you know. So hand quilters take into some of these into account some of these technical issues. I think too, um, ways to not hit the hit the hard spots. So. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things I went to QuiltCon last year in Austin and that I, I felt like was a trend at the time, although people said it's been going on for quite a while, but was the combination of machine quilting and hand quilting, you know, and big stitch quilting and, mm -hmm. and machine quilting together on the same quilt. I just loved that. And I felt like a lot of people were really embracing that. Um, do any of you do those kinds of combinations? Yeah. Or? yeah. A lot of times, actually, that's when I first started doing uh, string quilting or um, hand quilting a lot was I had made a zigzag quilt and I in the part of the zigzag was um, solid colors and I had already done the machine quilting and Tara and I were at our modern group and I said, I, you know, this is just too thick. I tried some. I didn't like it. I took it out. So I don't want to ma machine quilt in this. And Tara goes, you need to hand quilt that. And it's been ever since, it's always a combination, not always, but it's often a combination mm -hmm. of machine and hand quilting or just hand quilting. Mm -hmm. I remember that night, that was the night we yeah. met and we just yeah. sat and talked. <laughs> really? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I like the combination. Um, I always, you know, 
machine quilt in my quilts for what 15 years and I was always disappointed by mm -hmm. um, when a stitching line would interrupt the the patterning that I was creating in the quilt I was always disappointed and I was always trying to figure out how to make the quilting invisible and I often actually quilted with like that invisible thread because I didn't mm -hmm. want the quilting to show and um and then I, when I started hand quilting, I realized that what you said, Sarah, really struck, like I, I reiterate the patterning or the geometry of the quilt. But what I also find is really interesting is that with machine quilting, you see that line unbroken, 100% sitting on top of the quilt. And with hand quilting, it's, you know, maybe not 50-50, who knows what your stitch is like, but, you know, it's 50% fabric and 50% thread as you're looking along mm -hmm. that line. And it, to me, it just, blends with the quilt and it, it finally satisfied me in a way that machine quilting never did like I always felt like the quilting ruined my quilt I love machine quilting on other people's quilts but not mine um mm -hmm. so yeah I mean the problem is now I have so many quilt tops like 20 25 quilt tops piling up because <laughs> I just you know yeah. it's a lot yeah. slower to hand yeah. quilt so but, yeah. I have like two things to say to that as well, which is I'm, I'm really, really terrible at machine quilting. Like I'm very bad at it. I'm struggling. I'm stressed out and I don't enjoy it. And with hand quilting, I can leave my studio and sit on my couch because I lap quilt and just have a really pleasurable experience. So um, part of it is definitely aesthetic. Like I love the look of hand quilting, but also it's, it's, it's part of like my enjoying the process is I just, I, yeah. I'm the first to admit that I'm one of the worst machine quilters that you'll ever meet. And so, and I make really big pieces, so that's difficult too. Um, and then the other thing about hand quilting is that I, I want a few years ago, I got to really, I saw a big exhibit of Amish quilts and I saw that level of how small those stitches are so that the thread is almost inconsequential. It's, it's really looks like they're perforated, you know, it's just this textural thing. And as much as I love big stitch quilting, I love machine quilting, I love all that stuff. I think in my head, I'm, I'm trying to, by the time I'm 90, be able to make little <laughs> tiny perforated lines because of like what Tara was saying, it's, it's more of like a textural transformation rather than a sort of embroidered, you know, addition. I'm not there yet, mine are not that small. No, I've meant. been drawn to that tiny stitching as well and mm -hmm. um, buying the right tools for that. But uh, it takes so long. It it's, does. It's really long. It, mm -hmm. it, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is why quilting bees were invented because you need like five friends. Yeah. <laughs> get yeah. anywhere so that's the first thing I say to students when we start a class like a 10-week class I'm like quilting is slow don't don't think you're going to just be like one and done with this this is going to this is a commitment here so but it's so meditative I love being with my quilt at the end it's like this is kind of like my last before I send it out into the world I get to spend this time with it and it's really um I've even started hand binding them with big stitch because it's like oh yeah one more place to do that you know <laughs> it's, it's a very soothing kind of I, you know, my quilts are made for a different purpose and and to go with fabric lines and that kind of thing so they are machine quilted but hand binding I hand bind all my quilts and especially during the pandemic and I've been doing a lot mm -hmm. of also hand applique and all kinds of goofy hand things because I've just found it so soothing and at a time when soothing is really important <laughs> yeah yeah so, yeah yeah uh, megan i was going to change the topic because i saw in the chat something about um just the quilt behind me and they were asking how i made that block um okay. if that's okay that's that's a fan block here and it was because it's a medallion i wanted it to kind of have the going out from one, but, and that block is, you can learn that in uh, Wynn's book. She has one of those blocks. Yeah. Book. <laughs> Perfect book, yes. yes. I know it's out of print and it's hard to find and expensive, but it was just, it was liberating. <laughs> and this is, this quilt actually the design came to me watching Gwen do her um, speech at QuiltCon years ago. Mm. And I've never had a quilt just kind of pop into my head fully formed. And she was reading a poem called That Red. 
and how it started out, you're, you're attracted this to this perfect red, but sometimes the purples attract you and then the oranges and the pinks, and, but you always come back to that red. And in my head, I could see this quilt. And it was kind of an amazing journey to realize that, wow, you can have a vision and create it rather than just it's messing at my table and it becomes something. So when you teach Fern, do you teach more on the, the side of design or technique? Or is that a weird question for me to ask? <laughs> no, I think um, I try to really emphasize technique because once you get technique and you've tried a lot of different things, you can go anywhere. A lot of times in class though, people are attracted to a specific quilt and they wanna make that quilt. And I really like to, to push them, it's like, you know, learn how to make diagonal strings, how to use your little bits, how to um, change the size and add different uh, colors or um, geometrics and solids, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it's more like, once you learn this technique or these techniques, you can do whatever you want. And it's really fun to see students send me back pictures of what they've made and it not be a copy of what I just taught them. So. I think that goes back to the thing I was saying about this exhibit and feeling like this technique can be used in so, so many ways and is so versatile. And mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, one of my goals in curating the exhibit was tr to try and show a lot of different settings or ways that it was used because, and of course I like, you know, got this much of that because there's so much out there. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's great for him that you encourage them to go out and explore the because it's, it's endless what you can do with it. Yeah. yeah. Tara or Sarah, do you want to comment on that kind of that same question? Tara, I heard you say you're getting prepared for a retreat that's in a few weeks. Um, what's kind of the basis of, of your teaching? Uh, I'm definitely technique driven because I love learning all the techniques. I think I said that earlier, but uh, it, there's always a heavy emphasis on color and mm -hmm. value, contrast, composition. I like to think a lot about composition and design in a quilt layout. Um, and, you know, the more I, the more I teach, the more I learn because I'm not a very intellectual quilter. Right. I make I make quilts because they're pretty or interesting. I don't really think about it. And then when I'm teaching, because I have to put words to the processes, I learn to learn so much about why I do things yeah. that for me I don't think about. I just I do not think in words. Um, I'm just like, oh, 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 ah, you know, <laughs> that's what's going on in my head when I'm quilting. Um, and then so the, the process of teaching is really fun. Um, and so I like to teach techniques, but I like to give people the tools to um, create compositions with all of those things that I just said uh, that, that kind of allow their voice to shine through and, and start asking those same questions that I'm like, but what if you go darker? Mm. You know, <laughs> what if you go lighter? Mm. Uh, you know, very simple questions, but they have a lot to do with design, right? You know, with the look, so. And Sarah, you want to talk to us a little bit about your teaching and then we'll segue into the opportunity that you're actually teaching through uh, the Quilt Museum here, the Iowa Quilt Museum. Um, yeah, so I do, I do a kind of a hybrid of both of those things because I love design and I'm really, um, I get a lot of students who come to me as um, maybe they already know some basic quilting techniques, but they, they always say I'm not an artist or I'm not a designer. And so uh, one of the things that I really try and do, because I tend to teach longer term, like 10 week classes with people to sort of just make them feel empowered to become designers and to think of, you know, take ownership of that. So I always, again, going back to traditional technique, uh, traditional quilt patterns, I show how you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to start from nowhere, start with these basic things. So yeah, I'll teach you how to do a half square triangle or some of these things, but then really try and make the teaching about, look at all the possibilities that come out of these things. So I do teach pretty abstractly and pretty open-ended. And I think that's frustrating sometimes for people because they're like, but I wanted to learn how to make this quilt. And you know, yeah. I'll, I'll help them to do that. But I'm always like, these are your choices and you take ownership. So we, we talk a lot about all of these sort of more abstract design principles in my classes. 
on top of, you know, then we figure out what they need to learn. And then I'll be like, okay, here's how you do the seam or here's how you cut that shape or how you approach that. So, yeah. Really new quilter myself who does not come from an artistic background, um, not visual art anyway, my artistic expression is music. Um, I, I think that it can be really intimidating to think about going, uh, designing your own quilts. Um, I'm very much of a pattern follower right now. Um, and taking that leap from following the instructions to a T, which is something that I really enjoy, um, to creating my own and like, it might fail because it's not tried and tested yet. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a little scary to me, but the more I have these conversations with you all, um, and the, the artists and exhibitors we've had so far, the more I kind of have that craving to um, create something of my own. Um, now, it probably still will be quite a while before I get to that point because I quilt in very tiny bursts of time. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's starting to inspire me. Um, so Sarah, tell us a little bit more about the class that you've got planned. Um, it's happening virtually through the Iowa Quilt Museum on Saturday, September. <laughs> Saturday, February 27th, which is about 11 days from now. So tell us more about that. So it's going to be a two hour, two part class. Um, the first hour of it is going to be focused on um, the history of actual string. So it's not about string piecing specifically. It's about um, everything going back to the Neanderthals inventing string and then what that meant for um, human history. Um, looking at string as it appears in mythologies, as it appears in religion, as it appears in um, technology, um, how we use string today, how it's been important. And I love this history because so often um, human history is framed in terms of um, things that have survived like metals and ceramics and all of these kinds of things and how those have impacted technology or like the wheel and some of these things. But string because, and all fiber arts because they degrade have the physical evidence is usually lost. So it's gonna be a lot about thinking about um, history, our history and our civilization through the lens of, of the development of fiber and thread. So it's kind of all over the map. It's I'm not a historian, so I just picked stories that I think are cool or stuff that I think people might not know and then just throw it out there. So that's that's the first half. And then the second half is going to introduce um, some, we're going to look at some string quilts made by other makers through history so that we get sort of a spectrum of ideas, things that are similar to what are in the exhibit, and then talk about um, both technique, I'm going to cover very briefly um, foundation piece string quilting. So using paper piecing, um, but talk about, you know, different like Gwen's model of doing it or, you know, different ways to approach it. So we'll cover that and then um, do a design exercise. That's like what I was talking about doing a very, creating a very simple block and then thinking about the variation that it could produce as a quilt um, using string piecing. So it's a really simple exercise that kind of breaks the ice with the idea of design um, through string piecing. Cause you see it all the time in string piecing these picking one geometric form, string piecing that block and then playing with that, what that block will do. So that's gonna be the second hour. So that's, that's the class and it's all it's all asynchronous so people won't we won't be sewing together we'll be learning together and asking questions the class fee is ten dollars and you can find all of that information on how to get yourself registered on our website which is iowaquiltmuseum.org shoot i missed the last part there iowaquiltmuseum.org there it is um uh, if you're not able to attend the class at the time that it airs, we will record it and share the link with you, um, and that will be available to class participants for two weeks following the actual class. Um, but we chose a time where we thought we would it would be available from Pacific Coast time all the way to um, continental Europe. So if you want to join us, we would love to have you. Also on our website, you can find a link to purchase the virtual gallery walk admission that I mentioned earlier. You can find a link to our online uh, store, um, shop our online gift shop, 
and you can make a monetary donation to the Iowa Quilt Museum. If you're enjoying these programs and you find value in them, um, we appreciate your support that way if it's possible. You can also become a member, a supporting annual member of the Iowa Quilt Museum. Just pop on our website and do any of that. Um, Tara, Fern, Sarah, and Lindsay, would you like to use the chat window to let people know how they can find you online? Um, websites, Instagram, and all that jazz. And then, Lindsay, people want to know about the quilt behind you. Okay. Um, that quilt is uh, called Backyard Breeze. And one of the, I mentioned that things have happened in my quilting life that are my writing and quilting life that I never expected. And one of them was when I had a book, I wrote a book with Uppercase um, Publishing on feed sacks and Moda, who was one of my clients, Moda Fabrics said, would you like to do a line of fabrics based on feed sacks? And I was like, okay, <laughs> something I never <laughs> thought I would be doing. So this is my fourth line and my, my third line and my fourth line will be coming out actually this month very similar color palette. So this is a quilt that we, uh, my partner, design partner and I, um, we have Clark, Clark Street quilts because we both lived on Clark Street, um, designed. So it's called Backyard Breeze. It's available on my website. Um, and I, it, one of the things I was thinking about, I saw that question and I didn't find it, but I've done it in solids and it's really dark, cool solids. It's a very versatile pattern also, I would say, and pretty easy. So, but it's not at all what these, fine women are doing it. It's a pattern. <laughs> so. so just a couple more things from the um, chat window that we want to be sure we cover before we leave today. Judith is asking, are string blocks always made from a variety of widths or they could, could they be done all in one size? And I think the short answer is whatever you want, baby. Um, <laughs> anyone else want to elaborate on that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do a lot of log cabins. And mm -hmm. I really love the look of keeping the, the strings the same size. Um, yeah. But sometimes I do them different sizes. But yeah, absolutely, the same size is just fine. Mm -hmm. That was one of the challenges I would say in curating this exhibit is what is a string quilt? You know, um, because for that very reason, you know, do they have to be irregular? And I, I, I agree, Tara, it's kind of all over the place. It's kind of what you make it. So. Well, I really thought it was interesting to hear all of you kind of touch on the, the history of that string piecing. Um, and that's, I think, the best part about this exhibit, um, second to the fact that all of the individual quilts in it are really wonderful. Um, but the exhibit as a whole is such a great cross-section of both historical and contemporary quilts. And contemporary quilts that are more traditional in their style and their piecing. And then contemporary quilts that are very um, kind of push push the edges of technique, um, such as Tara's quilt behind us. So mm -hmm. it's a wonderful exhibit. And we are open to visitors 10 to four every day, 12 to four on Sundays. Um, and because we have such a large wide open gallery and because it's winter and because we're not getting a lot of visitors, we consider it to be a pretty safe place to visit. Um, we are encouraging our guests to wear masks, even though that's no longer a requirement in Iowa. Um, but we really do encourage people to come visit um, and feel pretty safe doing so. And then the last question I want to pop out from the chat window is from Marty. Um, do you find that using solid reading fabric is better than florals and prints? So in regards to prints, do you find you prefer something that reads as solid as opposed to reads as a floral or a print? I think it's really a personal preference. It's what, what do you want that look to be? Um, I, I use everything. <laughs> I'm a, um, I don't have any opinion on whether, I don't say, oh, I'm only doing solids or, oh, I'm only doing prints or I'm only doing this line of prints. I, I like to use it all. Yeah, there is no um, better for sure. I, you know, I just use solids because I've been a textile designer in-house in the quilting industry for 15 years and um, prints are work for me. So solids allow me to just not, not think about that. But I really want to start using prints so badly. Uh, but, you know, the, the daunting task of getting like a whole new stash together 
because I'm a stash quilter, you know, I don't just buy per project. It's daunting. I mean, I'd have to buy like thousands of yards to actually have enough prints that, to be satisfied to where I could start using them. So <laughs> <laughs> not going to happen right now. Uh, you need to just come over, Tara. We'll have a, you can dig through my scrap. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks. What I hear is everybody start sending your teeny tiny scraps to Tara. <laughs> um, I'll just tap my, send my address in. <laughs> But, but the funniest thing is, and Sarah, this kind of goes back to something you said earlier about being involved in the quilt world versus the painting world. You all know with 100% truth that if Tara really asked for that, people would deliver. Yeah. Um, because quilters yeah. are the most fabulous people. And, and I mentioned that I don't come to the quilting world except for the last five years or so, but it has just been such a joy to consider myself um, to be kinship with, with quilters because quilters really are the most lovely subsection of the human race, I'm just sure. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. You've already got your first three bags of scraps on your way, Tara. <laughs> Yeah, you guys can just find me on Instagram. You can send me an email. Um, I, you know, <laughs> no, but it's true. I love that you said that, Megan, because quilters are. I mean, it's just it is a special yeah. thing. I don't know if it's you know three hundred or five hundred. I don't know how long women have been quilting, um, but as long as there's they've you know hundreds of years here, right? Um, and it's just like this wonderful history of nurturing and not that all quilts are made to nurture, but many quilts are made to nurture. And I think mm -hmm. that really infuses the, the feeling of the community for sure. Yeah, and I think the answer to that question about florals or prints or whatever it's, and we all are just like, whatever it makes sense for you. I think that's yeah. that's the heart of it too. It's, it isn't this sense of hierarchy, like anything is better than anything else. I mean, you might think something is more to your taste than somebody else's, but it takes that pressure off of feeling like, I don't know, like there's something that's worthy and other things that aren't worthy. We just right. figure it out yeah, and we yeah. get there and, and appreciate work that's so different than our own, which is really nice, I think. Well, and that's the thing, you know, I chose the three of you to be in a program together um, because in this exhibit, you're among the, the contemporary quilters, the quilters, um, and I saw some things that you all had in common. Um, but looking at the, the quilts that we did today, even though there's so much that you have in common, your quilts are very, very different. Your styles, your design choices, um, and, and that's just really wonderful. Um, our exhibit uh, recently, two, two before this, was called Quilts That Break the Rules, and it was all about historical quilts that were, quote, ugly or wrong or whatever. Um, but that particular exhibit read, led to so many discussions, wonderful discussions about why are there rules? It, it's art, it's expression. Who cares that it's different than what you quote expect? Yeah, I, so what's, what's wrong with that? And I love to hear that, that mantra. And I think that that's really encouraging, like I said, to me right now, who is somebody who's very much a pattern follower quilter. Um, it kind of gives me license to say, hey, go down there, pick up some of that fabric and just start sewing it and see what happens. You know, it's, it's fabric, it's not gold. I don't have to worry about it. If it doesn't come out the way I wanted it to, I'll cut it smaller and make out something else. <laughs> right. Yeah, one of my favorite things is like, let's let's just waste some fabric. <laughs> just, what are you saving it for? <laughs> I think, I do think though, if you grew up with a mother of a certain era, which I did, Absolutely. Wasting fabric was like the worst thing you could do. And I feel like a lot of people come to quilting from that mindset. And so you guys are doing great work liberating people from that mindset. And I, and I have to say, I have a whole bunch of string piece blocks that I've been sitting on for years. And I'm now going to go after hearing you guys and do something with them. <laughs> Good. <laughs> you inspired us, inspired me. <laughs> I'm well, it's to wonderful to be brought together like this by you and, and, and Megan. It's been really fun. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So. I'm trying to stall for just a tiny bit because one of our listeners has sent me a picture in the chat window today, and I'm trying to see if I can get it downloaded enough to, quickly enough to show it to you all. Um, because she says that she fell down a rabbit hole while she was listening today, and I'm kind of in <laughs> interested to see what that means. Um, but while I'm stalling, I'll just let you know that our program next week, which is the 23rd of February, 
um, will feature um, Millie, and I think her last name is pronounced Carely. I have to, again, you email these people and then you have to actually ask how their name is pronounced when you meet them in person. But Millie is going to share with us um, the story behind Mary Barton and her con contribution to textile history. Um, Mary Barton was an Iowan and um, when she passed away she left an incredible collection um, to the State Historical Museum and also the um, Living History Farms and I think that there was a third, oh, the um, Iowa State University Quilt and Textile Center. So she's going to talk to us about that. Two weeks from now, we'll be back talking about this exhibit again um, with um, Sujata Shah. And I don't have it right in front of me. Uh, Ann Brower. And that may be it. And then on March 9th, um, we'll be joined by Mary Fons, who is the editor of Quilt Folk magazine, or Quilt Folk publication, and Jody Sander, who is the editor of American Patchwork and Quilting um, right here in Iowa with the Meredith Corporation. Oh yes, so here we go. I've got Diane's picture. This is what Diane has been inspired to do while she's been listening to you today, and I know you will all appreciate this. <laughs> <laughs> There's some prints for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, Diane has been sewing away while she's been listening to all of you. Kara, Fern, Sarah, Lindsay, anything else you want to share before we sign off today? No, no just thank you so much. And, and thanks for putting the exhibit together and for inviting you know, all of us to be a part of it. And I, I really, really appreciate it. It says the right. I should I, I have one quick thing I could say, which is we just got word that for sure this exhibit will travel to the New England Quilt Museum. So in uh, 2022, probably March or April, the dates are not finalized yet. But if you aren't able to see it at the Iowa Quilt Museum, perhaps that's another opportunity for you to see it then. So good. I'm glad to hear that, Lindsay. I knew that that was a discussion. That's wonderful. Um, <laughs> Our next exhibit after this one, and I mentioned this one's up through March 21st, our next exhibit will be quilts from the New England Quilt Museum, um, all floral quilts. So we're excited to be building a collaboration with um, those friends there. All right. Well, Tara, Fern, and Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. Lindsay, it's always great to have you, and thank you for coordinating these wonderful artists and this fantastic exhibit. If you know somebody who wasn't able to catch the program today, have them check our website, um, iowaquiltmuseum.org, for the recording. And pop onto the website yourself to purchase a admission to our virtual gallery walk, to sign up for Sarah's Twisted Threads class, to shop our online store, or to become an annual member or make a financial donation to the Quilt Museum. So from all of us here, thank you so much for joining us at our virtual Iowa Quiltscape. And we hope to see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.